Hello, everyone. Welcome back. My name is Manus Chavla, uh, and as always, uh, I'm joined by Brunella Rosa uh, on the Rosa Rubini podcast, Making Sense of This World. This week, we're talking about how sanctions on Russia are accelerating the polarization of the international payment system. So, Brunella, just to kick us off, uh, we've, uh, we're well into the war. Uh, could you give us a bit of a status update on what's going on, and, and particularly with a bit of a focus on the diplomatic efforts? Are we seeing any success on that end? Yeah, uh, in fact, the, the military offensive is continuing and intensifying on Kiev, Mariupol, and the other coastal city of Odessa is now under attack, as we started to say uh, some time ago, uh, in the sense that uh, clearly, if Putin wants to get the whole of the entire Ukraine, he also needs to attack the southern um, uh, western part of the country uh, and therefore start uh, uh, going back up towards the west. And that probably is the last bit of land that um, uh, Putin wants, the one um, bordering with Moldova, potentially also taking the hold of Transnistria. Mm. Uh, so potentially enlarging further the conflict and finishing up um, the job of taking the hold on the entire Russian speaking part of Ukraine. Clearly, the resistance of the Ukrainians is, is causing much more trouble than he expected. That's why he sent some, um, say, mercenaries from other countries in, into the world, including those from uh, uh, Saxony that, of course, he, he fought for so many years at the beginning of his mandate. Diplomatic efforts are not. Uh, uh, having an impact just yet, but it's clear from both sides that they haven't really started. Uh, some progress is made when uh, Zelensky said that probably Ukraine will have to give up the idea of joining NATO and become a sort of neutral uh, country, but you know, there's still lots of uh, uh, road to be made before going to any anything near to some form of an equilibrium, knowing that uh, uh, Putin will not stop until he knows that he can get diplomatically, at least what he can get militarily. So unfortunately, that's uh, the boundary of the conflict. Right. And so there's this diplomatic state of play, but there's also, as we well know, uh, an economic conflict that's been raging. And so a key part of this economic conflict uh, is how the West, and particularly the United States, has disconnected a number of very key Russian banks from SWIFT messaging system. So just to get started on that, uh, for some of our listeners that might not know precisely sort of what the implications of that are, uh, could you just recap what the SWIFT messaging system is uh, and what the sort of short-term impact of this decision would be? Sure. So uh, international payments are done uh, through commercial banks and then eventually central banks settle the transaction, but initially it's a commercial bank uh, uh, bilateral transaction that is carried out. And the way they talk to each other, so to speak, is by a messaging system that is called SWIFT, uh, which is a Brussels-based uh, effectively company, but people believe that it's always been perceived as being kind of dominated by the Americans and to a lesser extent by the Europeans. That's the reason why they can effectively uh, uh, disconnect, uh, uh, they could effectively disconnect some large uh, Russian inst uh, financial institution from uh, the system. Uh, if you are not part of the system, you can still do international transaction, of course, but it becomes much more complicated. You might need to resort even to old technology such as uh, fax machines and stuff like that. So everything gets much, much more complicated. Right. Um, and then I'm wondering, what's the Russian responses? How are they counteracting this? And have they possibly received any offers of help from other countries? So what Russia has been doing is effectively try to close its ties as, as much as possible with China on a number of fronts. They have asked for military help, at least part of the administration has asked for that. Um, and we know that then on the 4th of February, uh, China and Russia met in Beijing 
just in the, say, uh, on the sidelines of the Olympics, and uh, they signed a joint declaration of the Eastern expansion of uh, NATO, which is a strategic, effectively, uh, partnerships, kind of sanctioning the a strategic partnership between the two countries, which also carries important uh, uh, gas uh, uh, supply contract that uh, they have uh, uh, signed. Part of those agreements might require, of course, weapons, as we just said, but also potential financial uh, assistance. And one of the things that China can offer to Russia is its alternative international payment system called SIPS, this cross-border international payment system, which is, of course, not as developed as um, SWIFT, but is growing quite fast in Southeast Asia and other parts of Asia. And clearly, if Russia were to join it, uh, you can imagine that uh, it would be uh, uh, very advantageous for the system. It would become much more widely used and, uh, um, and much more uh, adopted uh, by other countries. Mm. And I'm also wondering if sort of, you know, crypto assets and the crypto asset industry plays any part in this, because we know that that's uh, been trying to, to be informed as an alternative payment system to our sort of traditional uh, system. But, you know, traditionally, it's been undercut for reasons of, you know, it's not as fast, it's not as cheap, it's not as environmentally friendly. Um, but could this war change things? Could, could this potentially be, uh, you know, see a resurgence uh, of reliance on crypto back systems for transactions and payments? You know, it's one of the alternative systems that can be used for international transactions. Clearly, as you said, it's not the most efficient. Even the crypto enthusiasts have kind of given up on the idea of using it as an international payment system and rather uh, pointing more to the possibility of being a store of value. And also on that, of course, there's plenty of uh, uh, debate on whether that's true or not. But clearly uh, now the crypto asset world is regulated, crypto exchanges are subject to regulation. And what has been observed is that uh, while banks have gone slightly further than the letter of the sanctions, the crypto exchanges have in fact only applied the bare minimum to comply with the sanctions and no much more, which means effectively that they could gain some ground during this crisis as a more widely used system of uh, exchange. What we have uh, signaled as a potential threat in the past is that uh, uh, by uh, banning Russia from SWIFT, effectively we would put uh, the country in the arms of the Chinese or pushing even further than towards these alternative means of exchanges such as the crypto world on which there's very little uh, uh, understanding still transparency regulation is just embryonic at this stage so mm. uh, it's kind of then losing further control on such a huge part of the global um, uh, territory if not the global economy because Russia is small but still is a gigantic country which can influence lots of uh, other countries in the region. And like you say, I mean, pushing the Russian more into the arms of the Chinese uh, might just be the next frontier in the sort of, uh, you know, American Chinese financial decoupling that we've been seeing in the last couple of years, this broader idea of deglobalization. Um, what could that look like? What could the two systems under that look like? Yes, that's, that's exactly the point. If, if that ban continues as is likely for some time, then Russia might feel totally appropriate to kind of uh, uh, adopt a totally different system for almost everything. Um, the, the, the payment system would be mostly the one used by uh, the Chinese, the SIPs. The digital currency might be the Yuan, the, the so-called ECNY, uh, oil transactions might be settled in Yuan as China has, uh, sorry, as Russia has started to um, suggest. So kind of we will see a polarization of the world in so many respects. We are already seeing that kind of balkanization, polarization of the global economy between US and China. 
that could go further ahead. And uh, you could see really two hemispheres kind of in competition one with another for the next few decades. The US and its allies kind of uh, spheres of influence and hemisphere and, uh, and China, Russia, Southeast Asia uh, on the other end, clearly with the notable exceptions probably of Japan and India, which together with uh, Australia and, uh, and the US form the so-called Quad, kind of the democracies of the uh, kind of Indo-Pacific uh, uh, surrounding uh, China. So international alliances, of course, in flux at this stage, but it seems to me we are going further down the road of the polarization of the globe, including on these payment systems. Mm. And, and this sort of broader polarization, you know, talk about central bank backed digital currencies. I mean, if we're on the same page, it seems like these are trends that uh, preceded, you know, the Russian invasion of Ukraine were well going on before then, but have only been massively accelerated because of it. So certainly something very useful to watch uh, going forward. Uh, and as always, Bernal, thank you so much for your, for your time and insight. Thank you very much. Until next time.